Welcome back for episode 12 on the podcast known as Awaken. I'm Daniel. And I'm Joseph. And we're your hosts. Today we're joined by Rocky Seto. Uh, he was a walk-on at USC as a linebacker before spending 17 years coaching at USC and for the Seattle Seahawks, respectively. In 2017, Rocky stepped away from coaching to become a full-time pastor at Evergreen Baptist Church at St. Gabriel Valley. Rocky, welcome to the podcast. Brothers, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm grateful to be here. Yeah, um, I guess like before we start, is there anything else you would like to share about yourself for the viewers? No, just uh, we spent those times up in Washington about seven years, and uh, it was a it was a joyful time. We loved it. Uh, we miss it. We live in Southern California now, and uh, it is 88 degrees right here. And uh, I heard it was like 60 degrees up there, but 60 is not bad for Washington. <laughs> I'm glad no, that right. going to Washington. <laughs> all right. So, yeah, let's get started. So, uh, for you, when your heart went to pastoring, like you said, the biggest question that you said Christians need to tackle was how do we portray Jesus in the most accurate way possible? Mm -hmm. And so, what I was wondering was with the emergence of social media, how do you think yeah. the image or perception of Jesus has changed since you were growing up? Wow, you know, I didn't grow up in a Christian home, and so where I grew up was where my parents are Iseis. I'm, I'm Japanese American, so that means first generation. So I'm considered Nisei. Ni means two, second generation Japanese American. They're from the old country. Uh, they were blue collar. My dad's a gardener for over 45 years. My mom worked like as a seamstress in in downtown LA, and so working hard. And making your family proud was kind of the religion, you know, and just be a good guy. And But they sent us to, growing up, the three of us, the, we, there's three boys in our family, and uh, there's a Seventh-day Adventist elementary school. And I'm grateful for my Seventh-day Adventist friends. A Seventh-day Adventist is the first person to give me a Bible. I start learning more about Christ. But there was a lot of, I would say it was very... Uh, works oriented is very legalistic so i i just felt like man there's no way I, I i make it as a christian if this is what it means okay i don't even eat the right foods you know there's dietary prohibitions i'm watching usc trojans on saturdays that was a no no you know so i felt like honestly i was like man i don't cut out for this i'm you know and uh so for the longest time i mean uh, throughout junior high school and high school uh, I, I i wasn't a believer and so, so I, I couldn't even relate to what you just said. Like I, I, I did, that was kind of my, my knowledge of it and uh, of, of our Lord. And then um, with social media now, I mean, what, what, what's interesting about what I'm learning about social media is anybody ha and anyone could have a platform at any time that you just put up ideas and, and thoughts. And fortunately, there's some good things. Unfortunately, just like ages ago, there's, things that aren't true about our Lord, you know? So I'd say it's a, and just like even on the internet, you can find great sermons. You can great, find great edifying things, but there's also a lot of bad things and untruthful things as well. So it's kind of a hit and miss type of thing, you know? Yeah. Um, I guess like when you look at the internet and just the emergence of social media today, mm -hmm. what do you think are the biggest misconceptions or misunderstandings people have about Jesus Christ? Well, I just think that uh, just the whole idea that uh, Jesus is here for you, you know, where it's a very man-centered approach to Christianity. I'd say that's a very dangerous thing, as if Jesus is here to serve us and cater to us. Yes, he serves us by by dying for us. What what greater thing can you have than that? But what, what the issue is that makes it a very man-centered, very humanistic, you know, and it kind of merges in. Christianity with our, our, our culture of our age where it's very individualistic and just like we have our iPhones and our, uh, our iPods and uh, I, uh, iTunes it's like whatever I want I create my own universe even on the, on social media you could create construct a Christ of your own imagination so I just think that matter of fact I know it's not like I think I know that as we look at the scriptures you, we get an accurate view of who Christ is so instead of looking at the social media it's important to be able to be able to look to the scriptures. So I would say those are some of the aberrant views of Christ. I mean, apart from just the 
very uh, heretical views of Jesus as being an angel. Jesus is a created God. Jesus is just a prophet. Jesus is just a man that lived the earth. Obviously, those ideas are out there, but I'm speaking more about we believe in Orthodox Christ, uh, 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 Christ, but instead of having it from a God-centered approach, we may have more of a man-centered approach where really if you sum up the gospel, the good news, right, this is the core message that we're all called to live by and to to proclaim is that if I were to sum it, I would say Jesus is Lord. Meaning I'm coming under the Lordship of Christ. I am his slave. I, he's my master and he's going to take care of me. I'm entrusting my life into his hands. I'm doing what pleases him. Whereas oftentimes it's kind of per, Jesus is portrayed perhaps as like he'll, uh, give you your best life now. He will uh, enhance your, your your social experience. He'll give you a certain type of a purpose in life and true to those things. But if that's the main thing that's sold about him or told about him, then we would come to Christ on different terms. You know, we, we, we may not come to Jesus on his terms. And so I just think those are just some of the things. I mean, you asked me a big, broad question, but those are some of the things that I feel like has kind of crept into who we, how we see Christ in particular, not just in social media, but just in our culture today. Yeah, um, just with... Oh, wait. oh yeah. Uh, I just wanted to ask you a quick question. Like, speaking no. of platforms and, like, how you, like, you mentioned that everyone has, like, their own voice, I'm sure, like, you being, like, in the spotlight as, like, an assistant coach at USC... And that, like, the Seattle Seahawks, you have your own, like, platform, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, is there, like, any ways that you personally, like, use that to, like, um, help try to evangelize or something? Yeah, I mean, just, like, uh, everything that God gives us, everything is a stewardship, meaning he owns everything. And we have to, we'll be answerable to him someday and how we were faithful and taking care of it. And in essence, for my coaching career, you're right, it was a, it was kind of visible as a visible life at the university of Southern California and then at the Seattle Seahawks. And here's an example. I remember talking to um, our players at the Seahawks one year, and this happened to be the 2013 year. And we have part of a Bible study. And, and I just kind of, this thought came to my mind and it's like, why do we want to win the Super Bowl? And this happened to be the year that we won the Super Bowl. And, and if it's kind of, yeah, it just happened to be that. It just, it just felt right, you know, like we're a pretty good team coming back. And it's like, man, we might have a shot at this. And But if it's kind of like the idea of like, so I could build my own platform, if I could build my own kingdom, I could make a name for myself. Those are all very wrong things. Those, those aren't the things of stewarding these things for God's glory. And what popped into my mind is, man, perhaps the Lord will allow us to win the Super Bowl and have like that big, uh, uh, audience and to be able to proclaim even after winning it that Jesus is better than even the Super Bowl and and so whatever that means to you guys out there listening is like whatever you do you want to make Jesus look good in it and be able to give him the glory and point people to the hope that even as good as winning a world championship is having faith in a, in a loving relationship with Christ is infinitely better you know so so I'd ask questions like okay what is your Super Bowl is it going to University of Washington is it going to medical school is it getting a wonderful wife or a husband or you know or having a good reputation on on social media getting a bunch of likes I mean those aren't bad things but in the end those are like that's like sand right that just goes away eventually and, and at the end of the day Christ our creator our Lord is the one that is with us forever, right? And Bible says nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And so that's kind of on the big stage, but let me just share you with you something very much more private. When we, the next year, as, as many of us may know up in Washington, we lost the Super Bowl, right? On the one <laughs> one. So the, the, I would say the audience was a lot smaller, but what happened was we're in Arizona and, and the, uh, I remember coming into the hotel room afterwards and my family's there and, you know, we have four children and, and, and my wife and I, and who, who's also from Washington originally, but uh, you know, people are crying, people are upset and it definitely felt real. And for others, it's definitely like you know, entertainment and kind of like uh, it's just a game, but for us it's livelihood. It's a big deal winning and losing Super Bowls and stuff like that. But on that platform, 
as a husband, as a father, as a disciple of my family, I was able to gather the family together and say, hey, let's pray and let's give thanks to Christ. And, and you know, people were upset. And I just said, to kind of set the context for why we're praying, I just said to the, the children, hey, does Jesus love us when we win? I said, yes. Does Jesus love us when we lose? They said, yes. That's why we could thank him, because no matter what, we have him. And he is the one that matters the most to us. So sometimes the platform is like thousands or millions of people perhaps to even just five other people. And so I believe all of us have a platform and it, it just depends on what setting it is. And no one platform is bigger than another. And honestly, if I could impact those five people more than the millions, I'll take the five people that they all look to grow to love Christ. Right. And then, and then, so, so we sometimes with, you mentioned social media, Daniel, sometimes we could get enamored by the numbers and it's like, okay, what is our outreach? What is our pool? What, what, what is our uh, a possibility of reaching more people? Well, let's just be faithful with the relationship that God's given us in the flesh, I'd say. Let's, not, let's put the flesh relationships above the cyberspace uh, relationships, you know, and just work on those. And those are the platforms that God's given us. So, no, I, I, Joseph, I appreciate you asking that. Um, I think... Everything is a platform is what I'm telling you, you know, and um, mm-hmm. so, and you know, you know what the, as the scripture says, you're faithful with little, you'll be faithful with much, right? Just, just be faithful with what you've been given thus far. Yeah. And like, yeah, like you said, everyone does have a platform and at the end of the day, when you post something or when you create some sort of content out there, you don't know who may need it you don't you don't like we our scope of our perspective is just really small compared to what i mean jesus has because like um like scripture said he knows all and i think it's just the fact that i don't know i really like the fact that you said impacting those five matters more than um those maybe millions of people that you've that you may impact just because I think when you know that when one person finds a lot of meaning into something that we've said or something that we put out there, um, I mean, at least like for me, it feels a little more intimate and I feel like it knows, like it knows that like, Hey, God's just working. And I think a lot of times we don't know necessarily what, how God's working, but it's just trusting and being faithful in that process. Well, I mean, someday, I don't know, you guys, single both of you guys you guys don't you guys aren't married right like i am right <laughs> i'm single okay so like i mean i mean honestly the bible i'm a pastor now i'm serving as a pastor bible says i need to be able to uh, take care of my household meaning i need to be able to disciple my wife and my children and if god willing god gives you wives and god gives you children we'll see what happens but those eyes that look back at you at over at dinner table or breakfast table are the ones that you are primary mi- uh, ministry and so and they, they're the ones that you love the most, honestly, right? And so it's like, let's not miss home by conquer, trying to conquer the world. Let's conquer and dominate home first. And from there, if mothership is doing good, then you're able to get out a little bit more with greater integrity too because people are looking to you and, and I and, and, and to be examples. And so although, you know, only God knows what's in our hearts, but – our families know the best and apart from God, you know, and you could fool a lot of people on the internet. <laughs> you really could, right? You could create your own perception. You could create your own identity. You could create a certain type of mystique about you, but none of it might not be true, right? It just might just be kind of a more of a facade. And that is where Phariseeism and just the, the religiosity of, of Jesus's day was, it's all about just external perception. And that's some of the dangers of if we're living on the on social media, and that's where we really get our most of our, I guess, excitement and, and kind of our affirmation. That's a kind of a dangerous place to live because they don't actually know you. There's no accountability other than what you or I decide to put up. Of course, we're going to put up the best uh, uh, angle of our pictures and, <laughs> and stories and and all those things that how we want to create our own image or create our own branding so to speak you know so and but when it's real relationships there's accountability because they could see you and i believe christianity is not a privatized thing where it's like hey that's just my own 
thing. And, you know, that's kind of private to me. If you're a Christian, you're part of something greater than yourself. Think about it, all the metaphors that the Lord uses for the, for the church. What does he use? Body. Jesus is the head. We're different parts of the body. Kingdom. Jesus is the king. We're different subjects in his kingdom. How about uh, the flock? Jesus is the great shepherd, the good shepherd, the chief shepherd. We're his part of his flock. You know, if we're using kind of more the Old Testament imagery, God the Father, and, and we're his children. We're part of his family. So it's very communal. It's always a group thing. It's always like I'm a part of one another. So I don't know what how deep we could get over the internet. You know, someday I'd love to meet you guys in person and 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 just so for us to get to fellowship with one another. But like uh there's accountability when they people could touch you, see you, see you offline. Okay, what is he like? What is she like when they win? What is she, what is he like when they lose? You know, and, and everything in between. You know, there's definitely accountability in that way. So relationships at the heart of what Christianity is about, obviously with him first, Jesus, and then with one another, other, other brothers and sisters in the, in the, in, in the body. Yeah. Um, I think what you mentioned that like caught my eye was like, when you mentioned family about like being like probably the closest thing to like shepherding, um, because we read that like one of the biggest concerns when you were like deciding if you wanted to coach was uh, being a good husband uh, along with your busy schedule. And like you said, you had really long days, but um, it's important. Like you said that it was important that being a good father and a good husband was important to you. Um, How did you like manage that time between like being a good like husband to your wife and also like being a good father to your kids? Well, that's a good question. And here's what happened in coaching. I'm telling you, especially during the season, it is like 90 hours a week, you know, and people ask me, you know, other than game days, what do you do for the rest of the week? I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I mean, all work throughout preparing for the game, right? You don't want to show up at game day and just kind of just roll out the ball. I mean, hours and hours and hours of film study and meetings. And, and then, then you get with the players. You just got to do all that work just to even get to the players. And once you get to the players, there's meetings and drills and practices and all that stuff. So grand total, roughly 90 hours a week. And so – if I were to be at home and, and, and uh, if that's my priority and I never saw my people because I'm working all the time, I don't know if I could say if home is my priority. Really couldn't. And so Coach Carroll, he's a great friend, and we were together for quite some time. And, you know, I was able to – he and I have a relationship. He trusted me as a coach. I can't just be in at 6 in the morning to like, 11 o'clock at night. He goes, how about this, coach? He said, what if I come in at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning – and then get home, and I'm going to leave right about 7 o'clock when everybody's done meeting. Now, that still is ridiculously long hours, but the way I made sense of it is, like, they're sleeping, so I'm not going to be able to talk to the family. So um, I leave I leave home about 3-something and get to Renton, the VMAC right there down the street from your house, Joseph, and, and it's dark, and the security guys are there. The, the, the janitorial staff is clean. The cafeteria. Is, so I got to know all those guys and started working about 4 o'clock, sometimes sooner. And then I try to get home roughly around 7. At 7, I'm able to maybe catch the end of dinner. At 7, I'm able to give baths at the time. The kids were little. At 7, I have maybe a quick devotion, quick prayer time. And then I pass out with them. And then I wake up get to work. And then sometimes a couple of days out of the week, I'd sneak back home, take them, pick them up, take them to school at ECS and then drive back to rent and VMAC. And, and somehow it worked by God's grace. I got up in time, you know, and, and by God's grace, the work was good enough, you know, and because if I asked coach, if I could do that and he knows I'm a Christian and I let my work suffer, that's going to be a horrible witness. I, I can't do that. Seriously, you can't, you can't say, I want to do this, and all of a sudden you're not being excellent with the work that people are trusting you to do. As a Christian, I mean, whether, whatever you do, you do it all to the glory of God. So whether you eat or drink, the Bible says, right? So, I mean, you need to be able to have a strong witness by being accountable to those who are counting on you, right? And so if it's kind of like, let me do this, and I'm not found trustworthy, then that would 
make our Lord look bad. So there was a big risk there, but God was so gracious. He got me up and, and like I said, he blessed the work and it was good enough. And I'm grateful for someone like coach because what we're, what, what he allowed to do is very countercultural in the NFL. It's like the first, the last, the first person to leave is it's like a bad mark. You want to be the last person to leave. Like, there's like a badge of honor, if that makes sense in from the office. So there's some good, uh, that, that's type of the culture that coach Carroll is able to shape to, he trusted me. And, and once again, it goes back to relationship. And so I think you want to steward those relationships well in it, but ultimately next to Christ, your family relationship is the, your primary uh, ministry. Like adding yeah. on, oh, no, go ahead, like go adding ahead. on, adding on to that. Like I know, um, like after you stopped to pass, um, coaching and like you started being a pastor, um, there's like a lot of other like, um, like I know that coaching the life sounds rough, but I'm sure being a pastor has like affected your kids too. Like I remember when my dad was going through seminary and eventually a pastor. There's a lot of nights where I was just like home alone, and I'm sure like, like having a pa- growing up as a pastor's kid, like there's a certain type of pressure. And like expectation that like like I face, and I'm sure some of your kids also will face. Right, um, right. So like I know that's like a reality, but um, like I think as a pastor, like do you have any response to that? Like yeah, I do. I mean, I'm grateful our, our church Evergreen SGV. Uh, the they were so gracious to me, and there's a good strong family culture here. And what I tell the the children is this, is like, hey, live for an audience of one, be be genuine, don't worry about putting on a show for the for the church members, they love you, they'll be gracious to you, but ultimately, be who you are before God. And so one of the biggest things I would say, it, 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 an obstacle to discipling the children for me is if I'm a hypocrite, meaning if they see a certain type of person at church, and then when I, when I come home, it's like this, <laughs> who are you, right? It's like, it's a show. That I would say that's one of the most damaging things for a leader as you, uh, as you try to lead anybody, let alone your wife and children. So it's like consistency is what people could live by. No one expects perfection, but they expect genuine. As, as, P, as Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? He asked him three times, right? At John 21, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And then, and Peter knew he didn't love him perfectly. He Obviously, he denied him three times. But Jesus wasn't demanding a perfect love for him, but he demanded a genuine love. Is it real? And so I try to be honest, you know, with people. I try to repent to my family and say, I'm so sorry. I lost my temper. That was completely wrong. Um, just know that I'm human. Can't you see how Papa needs Christ and the gospel too? And even with a church family, I'm not trying to pretend like I'm a, I'm perfect in any way. I say, hey, the other day I had to repent to my family. I mean, this is what it is, you know. And if, and honestly, if anyone's really honest with themselves and before God, I don't know. I mean, I don't think anyone's perfect, especially at home, you know. So I think just trying to be genuine, I think that's where that's what I don't want to put any other demands on my own family or myself that Christ doesn't even require me. He doesn't require me to be perfect, but he requires me to be genuine. And so I think practicing repentance and so if I've sinned against my wife or my children, just being quick to say, I'm so sorry, I was wrong. Unqualified, I was wrong. And, and please forgive me. And so I think that just the practice of repenting and just that demonstrates two things, that you're genuine, that's one. Two, it demonstrates that you actually believe in the power of the gospel, that you don't have to be ashamed of anything. You know what? I was wrong. But my shame, my guilt was nailed on the cross 2,000 years ago. I actually believe this. And so I think that those are things that we could do to kind of help disciple our people. Um, I guess like, I want to like move on a little bit. Um, I was actually really curious about this. So as your time um, on the Seahawks, like as a coach, you were given the opportunity to evangelize at multiple places, whether it was schools, churches, um, or prisons. Yeah. And to me, the most I'm interested is actually the prisons part. Is there like a story or a conversation that stood out to you from that time? Well, it was like, it's amazing. I mean, it's a stewardship again. Like I said, if you were coaching, I mean, you know, the Northwest is the 12s. It's dominant. You know, we have the greatest fans on the planet in pro football. And if you're part of the Seahawks, you go anywhere. As long as you tell a Seahawks story and by you say, you know, just, so you know, I'm a Christian and, 
I'm going to talk about Jesus. Is that okay? Oh, sure. That's fine. You know, so, all right. And so going into the prisons, I mean, uh, I was able to go to juvenile hall, even the women's prison in Tacoma, even in California, I was able to get into prisons just because partly because I'm an NFL coach. And then, so I just saw that as a stewardship, Daniel. And, and um, it just kind of, I forget how the first opportunity opened up. I just think I just threw it out to one of my friends and I said, I would love to go into the prisons and Bible says to go, go minister to the prisoners. So I was like, all right, let's do it. And, and it was pretty interesting, you know, and uh, what, what's interesting about the prisons, the reflection that you asked about is this in the church, you may call, talk to people about sin and repentance and forgiveness of your sins. And some people may be sitting there, you know what? I'm not so bad. This other guy sitting next to me, you know, I, I think I'm better than he is. I think God is, God's fine with me. But in prison, obviously something went wrong, all right? I'm sure there could be some cases where there are innocent people there, right? So I just don't – it's not a broad brushstroke. But you're there because something went wrong. Even if you're falsely accused, like, man, I need some hope. I would say hearts are much more softer in prison than they are in just regular everyday life for obvious reasons. And so when you talk about sin and forgiveness of sins, that's what Jesus came. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was his first sermon and, and, and as he started his public ministry. I think people are more receptive to forgiveness of sins. Like, yes, I need help, you know. And so I think during this coronavirus time, I've just been thinking and praying that, you know what? Some people's hearts may be a lot more softer right now because, man, there's so many uncertain things going on. Look at, we're all in our rooms and our homes and we're, we're kind of separated. We're not able to go out and go to the restaurants and even do church with our full number of people and all that stuff. And things are, stock market is down and all kinds of things are just tenuous, right? Like, will, will we be in person in the fall, right? It's like, or will we be Zooming at UW, right? All those weird things that are going on that we've never been through, but what a reminder by our Lord that says that he is in control. We're not, we could plan all we want for the next two, three years, but at the end of the day, none of this matters. You know, it's like at the end of the day, Jesus is the one that we look to. So I guess in the prison, it's, it's just kind of, I would say just naturally softer hearts to hear the gospel message. Yeah. And I think when you're in prison, like we all have like, kind of the opportunity to have the time and space to just kind of reflect on what may have gone wrong or mm -hmm. what may have just, what, what just happened? Why am I even here? And I think, I think like most interestingly, like I like what you said about how sometimes like someone that may not be in that situation might think like, Oh yeah, I, maybe I am better than them. But I think interestingly enough, just, I guess, well, maybe it's just because of social media, just like YouTube and stuff. But when I hear like a prisoner or someone who is in a tough situation talk about that time, I think some of there's sometimes like it, I don't think it surprises me, but um, it catches my eye how, um, how just being in that space, thinking and reflecting about themselves they start finding a lot of like truths about themselves or just about the environment they're living in. And I think, um, I think for all of us, a lot of the times when we're just like living our lives, um, sometimes we don't necessarily take the time to just reflect on either. I don't like for a Christian, like our relationship with God, how is our relationship or just even as a person that just thinks about where it where am I really at with my mental state and all that? And I think for like a prisoner who has taken the time to just think and reflect just about everything that's happened. Um, but not even just for prisoners, just like for all of us that if we just take the time and space to reflect and analyze like what happened, I think there's a lot of truths that we can find about ourselves and about um, our relationships. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's where um, I, I think that's just where um, I guess like wisdom and truths come out. And I think that's when people start realizing, well, I hadn't thought about this before, but now that I've kind of discovered these things, I, f I see life or I see the gift that God's given us in such a different manner. 
Well, I mean, in some ways, all of us have been in prison a little bit with this quarantine era, you know, and it's what I've been talking to our church family about is like the year 2020 is like the year for spiritual clarity, you know, and just to be able to see things clearly. And as we come out of this, God willing, sooner than later, are we going to come out the same or are we going to be able to see things more clearly? What's important? What are the priorities? How am I actually stewarding my time, my money, my energies? In Southern California, we could run ourselves ragged. You know, I got to go to this sporting event. I got to go to that. We got to do this, do that. And all of a sudden, you're so busy that you have no time, like as you said, Daniel, to reflect on anything. And so I think this is a time where God's given us a kind of a forced sabbatical to kind of push pause on a lot of stuff that's going on. And I think that's what you're talking about, you know, and for obviously for the prisoners, there's some very direct things they got to contemplate. But for us, perhaps we've been imprisoned by our way of life. We've been so busy. We've been just so ragged and we don't have time for our relationship with, and to grow and deepen with Christ. We can't grow in our deepened relationship with our brothers and sisters and even our own family members. Right? So I think those are the things that are going to matter. Even when I was at the Seahawks and now that I'm a pastor, I'm able to have some special moments where people are getting close to the end of their lives. You know, they're sick. They know that time is running out. The only thing that matters is their relationship with Christ. The only thing that matters is their relationship with their families. They don't talk to me about what they accomplished in their life. They don't accomplish. They don't tell me about their job accomplishments. They don't talk to me about how much money they have. They don't talk to me about where they live or their home. It doesn't even matter what kind of clothes they wear. It's about Jesus. Am I, what am I going? Am I going to be okay in the afterlife? If you, if Christ is your Lord and Savior, absolutely. And then if there's any relational things that they need to take care of with family members or close friends, that's what matters. So if you look work backwards, perhaps as we come out of this quarantine era. I like to call it, we could really reload and have better clarity of vision, 2020 spiritual vision, and just be able to see things more clearly and order our lives appropriately. And I guess like, I guess I want to ask like for you uh, with this quarantine and kind of this force of radical, like what are some things that um, you've kind of, I guess, reflected on? And again, like, yeah, like how, if like with the opportunity to um, when we have the opportunity to come back and just live um, out of this, um, I guess like what, I guess like what things have you like just learned or just like reflect about your current state? Yeah. I mean, relationships are so critical. You know, you just really cherish relationships. I'm like, I just miss seeing our church family in full force every Lord's day. I took Perhaps some of us took it for granted on every Lord's Day. Oh, I guess I go. I'll go to church today. Once I go to church, I'll, just, I'll turn on the Seahawk game or something like that. Right? And it's kind of like, it's like, are you kidding me? We get to go to worship the Lord together and see one another, and and I just the relationships are that much more valuable in my mind. And, and if I and repenting of just did I take these things for granted, you know? And uh, and what's neat is I've been able to like um, really just continue to enjoy my family more. And just, uh, we go on runs together. <laughs> I'm like, I coach them up and we're like, as if we're training for something together and we go, we go running around the block together. I mean, a couple miles, you know, I'm just kind of, they're do a pretty good job hanging in there and, uh, just kind of doing those simple things, you know, but realizing that the simple things that we get to do with one another are valuable. You know, all the other things that we get caught up in the hype of what the world gives value to, they don't really matter that much. Yeah, I, I like totally relate because I think like when I started college, I kind of took going to church for granted because it's like, oh, I got to like ride the transit and then ride the bus and it's like an hour trip. And I'm like, oh, I just church still, right? But like now that it's been gone, like there's that real like side of fellowship that I miss, like right. being with our brothers and sisters and just like like worshiping God. No, no, I know, I know. It's a, it's 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 what I'm. It's clear that. Christ is the most important, but then think about this. I've just been studying this some, and the Bible says that in John, Jesus is praying in his high priestly prayer, and he's praying to the Father and basically saying, love them with the same type of love that you love me with. What? Like, who are we? 
<laughs> we get to be loved by the Father with the same caliber of love that He loves the Son. And somehow in eternity, there's the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all right? The, the God's going to be there. But somehow the church, the bride of Christ, gets to be thrust into that love relationship that the, only the Trinity gets to enjoy. Are you kidding me? And so it's like that's just really deepening my love for knowing that just deepens my love for the church, you know, other brothers, other sisters. I'm like, wow, we get, we get to be part of this because our Lord has been so gracious to us. So you're not wrong, Joseph. I mean, just that deep longing to see one another. I think that's, we're going to have an explosion once we get to be together in full force again. I think we, we're, we won't take this for granted as much anymore. Yeah. And yeah, I think like for also me, um, kind of like Joseph, I was like during the school year, just, I think a lot of times for like me personally, I, I tend to get more caught up in like worldly things, like, especially like school, just because with all like the work and everything that we're assigned that, um, we tend to prioritize that over our relationship with God. And I think, um, the biggest question for maybe, maybe it's just me, but I think for most Christians, it's like, what do we really idolize? You know, like, what do we really value more? And if we say that we really love Jesus the most out of everything else, then wouldn't that be like the first thing we would do in the morning is just to praise him instead of thinking about, mm -hmm. Oh, I have this, this, and this to do today. And I think with um, quarantine, it's kind of given me that space to reflect on that and say, well, maybe I need to adjust my priorities a little bit. And at the end of the day, like you said, it's about um, saying that Christ the Lord is our savior. And as long as we say that we'll be fine no matter what. Yeah. I mean, really that's where, and really Daniel, like um, school and, and, and work and whatever we get to do is a real blessing from the Lord. And, as long as we get to learn to worship him in it, it, I mean, then it becomes a very beautiful thing. Like you said, you don't want it to be the idol that becomes more important than Christ, but you get, we get to steward what he's given us and worship him in it. But I'm just being, like you said, there's no substitute for, for being, having that time alone with him. You know, there is no substitute. So exactly. So we have to find time in the word. I mean, are we in the scriptures daily? You know, as if like, I got to hear from you, Lord. Like, it's like, it's just like a friendship, you know, like you're, whoever your best friend is, you know, it's like, if you don't hear from them for a while, it's kind of like, Hey, what's going on? Right. It's like, do I really believe that this is, this book is God's word. And every time I read it and understand what it's saying, that God is literally speaking to me. Do I actually believe that? Do I actually believe that Jesus is speaking to me when I open up this book. And so it goes back to just how much uh, priority do I put in just my relationships and Christ is our number one priority. Yeah. And it's just uh, like you said, it's just being thankful for the fact that we're given the opportunity to have those relationships. And like, um, I think like something that I've realized over the past year is that, you know, we're told to seek, community and seek relationships with other people and that in the end um that's the most important thing because we can accomplish whatever and we can um we can accomplish whatever and we can win whatever like competition whatever it is but at the end of the day um i think something i've realized is that like relationships are like the most um lasting thing out of everything because yeah. like i think i've noticed that um, even when you do accomplish something that um, you have that sense of joy and excitement for like 15, 30 seconds or, or for like that whole day. But then after that, it's about what's the next thing, you know, what's the next thing. And mm -hmm. I think, I guess like in sports, like something I've thought about was when players win a championship, um, they say it's like one, like some say like it's one of like the greatest moments of their lives. But then mm -hmm. a couple of days later they say, well, I have to get back to work to win the next mm -hmm. one. And mm -hmm. for me, I was like, I've always contemplated. Um, well, if you say this is like the greatest moment, then how can that sense of joy kind of just 
not necessarily like go away, but um, I guess be such a temporary thing where you're already focused on the next task, the next task or whatever. Right. And I think when I started realizing that, um, I started seeing that, oh, there's a, there's a bigger purpose than mm-hmm. just a bunch of accomplishments or awards. And I think just with this time that we've been given to say, we have an opportunity to like redirect our priorities, redirect um, what we truly value. And I think that's something I've really realized. Right. Right. I mean, <clears throat> people have asked me, what do you miss most about coaching? And yeah, I miss the game. Sometimes I miss the practice. Uh, I miss the, when it comes to playoff time or it feels kind of exciting, but, relationships i mean the people the men that i got to work with the coaches the players i mean i have utmost respect for these guys and we got to win and lose together we got to be on mission together it's it's the relationships i mean a lot of these guys are still keeping contact with and uh even those who aren't christian you know and and particularly those who are christian i'm that much closer to but it's the relationships that we are that makes life so rich, you know. And so, sometimes the accomp the, the 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 activities are just kind of vehicles to kind of develop good relationships and strong relationships at that. Yeah, for sure. Okay, um, is it okay if we move on a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, um, in this next part, we're just gonna ask you like uh, a few like f- more f- like I just like the questions we have that we're just curious about. Um, hmm. You don't have the answer like in depth, um, but Daniel, you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, as a coach, I was more on the defensive side of the ball. Who was the hardest team and quarterback to prepare for? That's not the Patriots. The Patriots weren't the hardest. Oh, I, wow. Okay. I, I didn't think so. I mean, they're good. The hardest was probably like Aaron Rodgers, the, the Packers. They were tough. Cam Newton, when he was healthy was ridiculous i mean even even colin kaepernick the, those guys who could run and those guys who could throw my goodness those guys give me nightmares getting ready for the team. but i mean the patriots are tough too for sure but i mean I, I just felt like those teams with the guys who could run and throw man i mean that that was really hard okay um next one so in my opinion i thought during your time that marshawn lynch and richard sherman were the most they had like the most uh, personality. I guess like I wanted to ask like, what were they both like in the locker room? Uh, I coached, I had a chance to be closer to Richard Sherman. Yeah. yeah. One of my favorite guys I ever coached. He was so serious about the game. That's all you want. That's there. That's all that you ever would want as a coach is how serious he is. You can take it. I mean, he's a cover corner guy and, 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 um, obviously with a bunch of interceptions and stuff like that, but he was the best tackling corner in the NFL. That means you got to throw your body in there, Daniel. That means that that (laughs) this skinny cornerback has to throw his body into a 230 pound man running as hard as he can. And he did it. And so, and then with Marshawn, I mean, he was a beloved guy on their team. I mean, he was like, obviously played his brains out. He ran hard and, but people loved him, you know? And so these were these guys definitely have personality, you know. And uh, so, if you want bland football, is not the game to be a part of, you know. These, these, some of these guys have a lot of flair and different personalities, and which kind of added to our team. And, and um, at times, it's like it could be challenging, but re- overall, it was a phenomenal thing having those guys on. All right, um, my question is: uh, so you lived in Seattle or like Renton area for like a couple of uh, like a pretty long time, I would say. Um, but now that you're back in California, what are like three things or like just general things that you miss about living in the Pacific Northwest? Well, gosh, I mean, I just, <clears throat> the people, first of all, the relationships we have, people at Cornerstone and the Seattle Seahawks, Eastside Christian, um, those communities, our family, we have uh, my wife's family's from up there. So the relationships are huge. That's the one that we miss the most. Second, I just love the area, you know, just, it's just such a beautiful place, you know, just with the lakes and the trees and I go hiking, go jogging around the neighborhood. And then actually I didn't mind the cooler weather. You know, I mean, 
I mean, I, I kid with you a little bit because it's almost 90 degrees down here. I like that too now. Don't get me wrong. So maybe I'm trying to be nice. But I didn't mind wearing, wearing a hoodie like you have on, Joseph, and wearing mm. some. <laughs> and I was kind of almost my daily attire, you know. And so, but I, 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 I like that too. So just the area, I'd say the people are very uh, uh, friendly and very nice and up in the Northwest, you know. So um, it's, just, it's just a great place to be. Yeah, and um, my other question is, like, as a coach, what's, like, like, it could be a college or, like, in your time in the NFL, but, like, what is one of your most treasured memories that you have? Shoot. I mean, there's so many. <clears throat> so we talked about friendships and relationships, but I'm, I'm thinking you're asking me about maybe a certain event or certain game. Um, I would say uh, maybe as a player at the University of Southern California, I walked on. All right. That means I wasn't recruited. That was, that means I have to pay for my own tuition and all mm -hmm. that. Stuff. The next year they awarded me a full athletic scholarship. That was a big deal because for a lot of reasons, financially, it's expensive to go to USC. I mean, <laughs> I, mean yeah. More yeah. <laughs> I mean, you get it. UW is expensive too, but, <clears throat> but um, I remember when I got the scholarship, um, I didn't call home. I, I waited. I drove home, which yeah, I lived about 25 minutes away. I just drove east back home to Arcadia, went to my parents' house. And so guess what? I, like, they gave me a scholarship. And then when my dad heard that, he was just said, you know, he said something that I'll never forget. He just said, you know what? Haruki, that's my Japanese name. He said, you made me believe in the impossible. And then and it was like, shoot, that means more to me than a lot of stuff, you know, and just that affirmation that you get from your father, it was a big deal. And so I'd say that was one of my favorite memories. <laughs> it's hard to even just pick one, but that would definitely stands, uh, stands out from the rest. No, yeah, as an Asian like, person myself, like I think my parents would like freak out if I told them like, yeah, like I tried out for a team and they gave me like a full scholarship. Like they would be like beyond. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and so I mean, and that's why I got into football because <clears throat> I know my dad loved it, and we watched games together. He used to tell me about games that he went to at, at the Coliseum to watch USC play. Although he didn't go to college, he was got into the game somehow. And uh, those are the things that kind of drive young men. You know, you at the end of the day, no matter how old you get, I'm 44 years old. I still want to please my dad. I mean, that's just that's never going to leave us, right? It's what I'm saying. Something about dads, something about father. We love our mothers. I mean, I love my mom to death. And <laughs> the Bible says the glory of children is our fathers, right? And so there's something that there's a some unique in, uh, influence that we have as men with our children. That's what it is. That's how God set it up. That's how God called men to lead the homes. God called men to lead the church. We're the strength of the family. We're the strength of the church. Where our wives and, and the sisters of the church are probably more the heart of the church, if that makes sense. So we need both, but we have a role in that to be provide strength and protection, and direction, and and for our families and for our churches. Yeah, <clears throat> and so we have one more question for you. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about the time where after you graduated from USC, um, yeah, you had to make a decision between going to grad school for physical therapy or um, coaching football and your parents had encouraged you to continue on to grad school but your heart was pulling you in a different direction and so what type of advice do you have for people that are wrestling with what um, other people are maybe encouraging them to do versus what your heart was really telling you to do well let me just say this much i mean my parents they gave me their best advice i mean i'd probably tell the same things like go get your doctorate degree that that sounds pretty good right <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> i talked to I talked to coach hackett i mean plus from a first generation immigrant family where my bro my older brother was the first to go to college i'm the second and that's like that sounds like a pretty good deal right and but i talked to my coach coach hackett at usc and i just said hey I want to go into coaching. Can I volunteer or just be around the staff? He goes, what else do you got going on? Well, I got into the doctorate program of physical therapy here at USC. He goes, are you kidding me? Go there. Coaching. <laughs> right. So it's like, he was testing me to see like, um, if this is what I wanted, but this is the thing brothers. I mean, nothing wrong with physical therapy. What a noble profession. You get to help people get better. I mean, it's phenomenal, but I, I my heart, 
wasn't really in it. The reason why I wanted to go there was just to get the doctorate. It was just more from materialistic reasons just to say, look what I accomplished, right? And that's really not what, that's really not the right motivation. And by that time, I was already a Christian. God saved me in 1998, my, you know, at the top of my uh, junior or junior year. And, um, and so basically, I would say this, what has God uniquely gifted you to do? Bible says we're saved by grace, right? And in Ephesians says that God has predestined us for good work. And so what has he gifted you to do? And so, well, how do you know this? Well, first of all, what am I good at? You know, when he formed you in your mama's womb, what do he make you good, naturally good at? That's one. Two, what do you like to do? What do you have a passion, burning passion for? And so those are some ways. And three, what kind of opportunities do you actually have? So all of that is all about God's providence. Your gifting, you had nothing to do with it. Sure, you have to work at it and all those things. Your passion, somehow you, you're birthed into these things. And like for whatever reason, providentially, my dad was into it. I got into it. Thirdly, there was an opportunity to go into coaching. Coach Hackett could have said no, but I'm grateful for that man because he gave me, among other things, a scholarship, but also an opportunity to start my coaching career. So the providence, you know, as you look at your life, how did God shape you? How did God form you? If you're doing it for materialistic reasons, perhaps that ain't the way to go because you're doing it for the wrong reasons, you know. So um, I can't even tell you why uh, it happened this way, but I'll say this much. Same reason if I go into, into, into the pastoral ministry, the reason why I want to become a pastor in some ways is kind of the same reason why I want to go into a coach, becoming a coach is because I had so many great coaches. And so in, in my mind, I said, man, I, will, I, I respect these men so much. I want to be like these guys who could help other people out, help other players, help other coaches out. So that's really was the genesis in the root of my heart of why I want to be a coach. And then so in pastoral ministry, I, I, I just see the power of God's word when it's preached by the power of the Holy Spirit, people are faithful to the Bible, God's word. Lives are changed. It changed my life. So I was thinking to myself, man, this is exactly what I want. I want to be able to preach a message um, that that everyone needs to hear. And so that's kind of like what I would say. You know, how's God uniquely gifted you? What? How do you discern that what God has uh, prepared you to do from before the foundations of the earth? You know, it's all planned out. You know. Let's not stress out about it so much, you know? <laughs> yeah. And look how it's worked out for you, man. Uh, thank you for thank you for coming on, man. Appreciate it. No, man. I, I love uh, Washington. And Daniel, when I said you heard from UW, you know, of course I'm a Trojan. You see that? I, I, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but maybe my next favorite school university is the University of Washington. So hey, it's a great university. I love that. I've been on campus, Red Square, Cherry Blossoms. I know that place, you know. I've been yeah. to the stadium, is phenomenal, you know. And I got to know some of the coaches there, and so I mean, football coaches. And so it's just uh, my family went there, other than my wife. My wife went to USC, and thank God she did. And uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's just, just a phenomenal place, but also double ACF, you know, it's been a Double ACF is big down here in Southern California. You guys are hanging in there because I know you guys are way up in the Northwest. And there's a bunch of schools down here in California, but uh, you guys are holding it down and I'm grateful for you guys being faithful to taking care of that ministry up there. Yeah, we appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. No, yeah, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks guys.